Hey everybody, it's Evan here at Method, the website where we teach architectural designers how to use digital tools for design at getmethod.com. And today we're talking about Maxwell Render and their newly released plugin for Bonsai 3D. I know there's a lot of uh, Bonsai users out there who are looking for other ways to render their designs and Maxwell is a great choice. I wanted to show it off to you and show you basic overview of how it works and what it can do and uh, then we'll get into more technical things as I go through these uh, series of videos. So this is part one of Maxwell Render for Bonsai 3D. Okay, so when you purchase Maxwell Render from Next Limit, the company that sells it, uh, you get a license for all of their different things that have to do with Maxwell Render. So that includes Maxwell Render, Maxwell Studio, MXED, um, and then also any one of the plugins that you want for all of the different 3D programs that you currently use. Basically the, the portal site takes you here. Let's go ahead and look at the download area where we can then download a couple of different things. Number one, we need to download Maxwell Render Package for your operating system. So you want to choose the full version unless you're upgrading from an older version. And then you select your platform and then download it and you can see it's a 130 megabyte file so it's a little bit large and then the next thing that you need to download is the plugin for the different for whatever uh, 3d app you're using and you can see that Maxwell runs in 3ds Max, Cinema, Lightwave, Maya, Moto, Rhino, Archicad, FormZ, SketchUp and now Bonsai 3d and that's one I wanted to show you today and so you'll notice that it's only a single download for either one. Both plugins are included within the 8.8 .8 megabyte download. So let's go ahead and download that. And then once that's downloaded, I'll show you how to install it. Um, something else worth mentioning here are the other download section where you can download the Airway material collection, which is 32 materials that somebody took some time to put together actual Maxwell versions of those so you don't even have to do any of the work to create those materials um, and those are from airwaytextures.com which is a really cool site where you can look at take a look at all the different materials that they have to author, uh, offer not all these obviously come with the Maxwell version um, but if we take a look at their products here, you can see that there's lots of different DVDs full of concretes and woods and tiles and all these different things. Definitely worth grabbing that and then uh, using those inside your Maxwell files. You'll see we also have updates for the latest plugins and Maxwell Render on this page as well. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and actually install the plugin. So I'm on OS X. And this Maxwell Z folder is what I need. I'm going to go ahead and copy that and jump to my applications here. And in Bonsai 3D, I'm going to go to my latest version of Bonsai, which is 2.4. 2.4 is the earliest version of Bonsai that you can use with Maxwell Render. So make sure you have the latest Bonsai application that you're fully up to date. And just to check that, if you're inside of Bonsai, you can go up here to the help menu and check for updates to make sure you're at the most current version before you install the plugin. Okay, so if I jump back, we're going to go ahead into the plugins folder in 2.4 and paste the Maxwell plugin. And you can see there's actually two plugins there's the attributes and the render plugin. It also installs the manual, which we'll talk more about those in a little bit. The other thing you want to make sure that you do is grab this checker.tiff file and drop that into the support folder. Okay, That is part of the installation process. Make sure you don't forget that. If you look in the plugin manual, if you look in the installation section, it does cover all of those things. And But that's basically it. That's all you have to do. Okay, so once you've done that, you can go ahead and open up Bonsai 3D, and you'll notice that as soon as you do open up Bonsai 3D, we now have a new icon up here for Maxwell Render. And Maxwell Render is obviously a photorealistic rendering program, 
And so this gives you just more options, unless you're already using uh, Bonsai's Render Zone, or maybe you're using Artlanis. This is just another really great option for those users who are using Bonsai. And so you can pull up the render options just by hovering over the Maxwell Render icon, and you can get to all the options right here. Or if you go to the Display pull-down menu, you can hold down the Option key and click on Maxwell Render to pull up the options. So let's just talk about what these are real quick. Um, basically, we've got an action pull-down menu, which allows us to send the file that it creates either to Maxwell Render or Studio um, or to a network render. And then one of the other options here we have is a pack-and-go, which allows the whole project to be packaged up into a single bundle with all the, the textures and everything in the scene all placed together. And then all you need to do is grab that folder and you can take those to another machine to render those off. So for instance, if you're working at home one night and you wanted to build a project, but then you wanted to render it maybe on a faster computer at work, you can use the pack and go project. And all the material dependencies and everything go with the project that way. And you're not going to leave anything behind on accident. So that's a really great feature. So you could choose that. And then when you hit OK, it will, it will pack the project up and it will take it into, an, in, into its own standalone folder. So when you do a, a pack and go project, you get a whole folder hierarchy with your project automatically saved. And um, basically what happens is it saves per view in your project. So if you're rendering view number five, for instance, you're going to get um, the project view five Maxwell folder. And inside the Maxwell folder, you're going to get all the dependencies, which include the texture maps for the project. You're going to get an MXI file an MXS file and then the rendered image which in this case would be a PNG and the MXI file is a Maxwell file that can be opened up and all of the changes can be made to the rendering without ever having to re-render so you could adjust shutter speed and aperture and all those things just by opening up the MXI file and saving out a new image without waiting for a new render so the other option that you have under Maxwell action pull down menu is pack and go scene and basically the difference there between pack and go project and pack and go scene is that you want to use pack and go scene if you're doing network rendering or distributed rendering and so basically all of the materials are embedded into the scene file um, so you have you have scene file you have textures it'll also save out IES lights which are not embedded but they're they need to be called upon um, HDRIs uh, same thing they need to be called upon during the rendering but all those paths are, are relative to that folder and therefore the, the computers don't have to look for those files. And so, so basically the rule of thumb is use a um, pack and go scene for network rendering and use a pack and go project when you're taking the project between workstations. So typically you're going to leave this on Maxwell if you're just going to hit render and expect a rendering to happen. And then the next thing here we have, I want to spend a moment on talking about this quality performance. Um, Maxwell Render is mimicking real-world photography and so what happens when you hit render is that it starts rendering and the project slowly gets refined as it renders so the image when it first starts rendering is something that you could use right away as maybe a placeholder or whatever and make sure your materials are rendering properly but you could stop it right away or if you choose to let it continue, it will just get better and better and better until you're ready to stop it or until time runs out and the limit you can set right here. So the default numbers, I think, are 30 minutes and 25 samples. And basically what happens here is that these kind of work together. Um, whichever number it hits first is what's going to stop Maxwell from rendering anymore. So you want to use the time constraint when you have like a hard and fast deadline and you know that in 90 minutes you need to have three renderings so you could set the time limit to 30 minutes per view basically and hit render on each one of those views and know that in 30 minutes you're gonna have something that's usable and you know some images depending on what's in the scene might be crunchier than the others but you know that if if you need coverage you definitely want to use the time constraint you could set the sampling level high you know 18 to 20 and you'll probably never hit it within that amount of time but then at least you know you're gonna get three d 
decent renders in 90 minutes out of it. So typically I set the time really high, you know, let's just set it to a thousand. You might set this at 10,000 minutes just so that time never runs out. And, and then you could just let this image render overnight. And then in the morning when you, when you check it out and if it's good enough, you can just stop it at that point and use it. So sampling level is similar in, in whereas Maxwell, when it's rendering, it renders one level at a time. So in order to reach sampling level 25, that's going to take some time to get to. And 25 is a very refined image. So typical renderings like of a project like this, for instance, might be maxing out at, I don't know, 16. So what you want to think about when, when you're looking at a maximum sampling level to achieve, you want to look at how much glass or water, basically the types of materials where you have lots of reflection, refraction, transparency. Maybe you have materials with subsurface scattering where light is bouncing around inside of objects and again the longer that that computes the better it's going to look so your sampling level could get you know up to 25 could get higher could get to 32 depending on the scene a scene like this you're probably you know 16 max um, and that would be sufficient so again if if maxwell reaches e either one of these numbers first it will stop the rendering so when it comes to choosing a sampling level, uh, one thing that you might take into consideration here is that if you're doing uh, an animation where you need all of your uh, images to look the same, they all need to achieve the same result um, because you might have one computer rendering one frame and another computer rendering another frame and then you know all the computers on your, your network are rendering a different frame, obviously they all need to look the same or else the animation is not going to play back smoothly, it's not going to look smooth. So that's when you want to set the, the time limit extremely high and you want to set a baseline sampling level so that you know that Maxwell will hit the sampling level first. So if you set a sampling level of 12 and you set the time limit to 10,000, you know it's going to hit sampling level 12 before it hits 10,000 and therefore all of your images are going to appear consistent across the board. Now the only other thing that you need to have in a scene to actually render with Maxwell um, is a Maxwell light. Okay, so I've opened up the lights palette here and you can see that the two lights that come in every bonsai project are ambient and sun. You can go ahead and leave those there. If I hit the plus button and create a new light, um, what's going to happen here is it's going to make a light number one and it's kind of like a sunlight. I'm going to go ahead and turn that into a Maxwell light by opening it up by double clicking on it. Okay, and you'll see that basically in the Maxwell options here, it gives us five new types of lights. We have Softbox, IES, Sky Dome, Physical Sky, and IBL. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add the Physical Sky option here. And I'm just going to leave all the, the defaults for now. We'll get into all this stuff later. I'm going to go ahead and just call, say OK. And that's all you really have to do to begin rendering inside of Maxwell. So you don't have to apply any Maxwell materials. You can just go ahead and use all your bonsai materials that you, you've already started using. You can go ahead and look through all of bonsai's material libraries and apply these and they'll automatically translate into Maxwell materials. Okay? You do have the option, this is another place that, that the plugin works inside of bonsai to choose material types Maxwell and actually load in Maxwell materials as well. Um, but we're not going to get into that until the next video. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is just go ahead and hit the render button up here, and I'm just going to double check my settings here real quick. Um, sampling level 18, that'll be good. Um, real quick, some of the other things that are going on in here in the image tab, you can tell it what type of image to save out. So if you like TIFFs or if you like JPEGs, I typically render to PNG. Um, PNG gives you an uncompressed image that still is a pretty small file size, so I, I like to use that. You can also choose a different color space if you like to work with Adobe RGB um, or Apple RGB or any one of these options, you can choose that ahead of time. And you can also go ahead and tell it if you wanted to render alpha channel. So for instance, if you want this whole background back here to be an alpha channel, so you could put in your own sky in Photoshop, you could choose that option. Um, some of the other options are material ID, 
Z buffer, shadow buffer, all that kind of stuff. You could turn those on as well. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at render for now. All I want to do is save out the render layer, but you could take all these into Photoshop later if you wanted all these to really create the image that you want. You have the option to do that. Okay. We also have a camera tab here, which gets us into how Maxwell really works, which is based on a physical real world camera. You can see that we have a setting for f stop and shutter, and then we also have an ISO setting. Um, and if you really want to get deep into it, you can actually set the dimensions of the film back. You can set the, the qualities of the diaphragm. You can even do shift lens techniques like Ansel Adams type photography where you can actually distort perspective and really play with uh, depth of field and things like that. So it does help to have an understanding of how real world photography works. And if you want, you know, go ahead and jump onto Wikipedia if you don't know anything about it and take a look but basically when you are taking a picture with a film camera and now even digital cameras do this you have control over uh, aperture which is f-stop and shutter speed okay so these work together when you're taking a picture f-stop refers to the size of the opening in the lens so the smaller the number here the larger the opening all right, so if you want to let lots of light into the camera, you want a very low f-stop. If you wanted to let less light into the camera, you would have a very large number, like say 22, in your f-stop settings. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that down low for now because I'm doing kind of an exterior daylight image. And then shutter speed, this number is how fast that actual shutter stays open for. So if you want a very slow shutter, you want to let lots of light in, this number would go down very low. Okay, so you know a shutter speed of one is actually one second. All right. So if you wanted it to be open for less amount of time, which is typical, you know, fourteen hundred, that's one fourteen hundredth of a second. Okay? So you see it's one over this number. All right, so these are kind of typical daylight numbers. And then we also have the, the ISO of the film. So 100 is good for daylight, um, but you might be higher if you're doing you know, night shots. You might be up at 800 or 1600 or 3200, depending on that sensitivity. How sensitive do you want that to be? So it does help if you have a basic understanding of how a camera works with, with uh, shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. And I, I have found this great resource online. It's at this website right here. It's at camerasim.com and uh, what you can do is learn how a camera works by using this viewfinder right here and, and basically what it does is it, it simulates first of all you know one thing that, that really matters when you're taking photographs is you want to set the lighting for the type of uh, scene that you're in. So if you're if you're doing a sunny day Go ahead and set that up. If you're if you're doing a dim indoor shot, you can you can diff take these different photos. You can see what happens. So on a mostly sunny day, you're going to get a photograph like this. If your subject is about you know seven and a half feet away, if you if you get her closer, you can see the background gets blurrier with these particular settings. And right now the camera is just set up to manual mode. But this is a great little website to kind of learn how a camera works. So you can set different distances, you can set different focal lengths, which is a wide angle lens would be this way, more of a telephoto lens, up to 55 millimeter, which is kind of a normal lens. Um, it's going to be more like that. So you can play around and all of these things basically play into how the camera works and the type of image that you're going to capture. So if you're going to get a lot of depth of field or if you're not, um, you know, if, if your distance is farther away like, like that, then everything's in focus depending on those settings. So you can play around with this website and get a really good understanding of how all of these different settings affect a real world camera. So basically uh, if you increase the, the ISO you're increasing the sensitivity on on the the capture and so basically what that does is like it's it's exposing the film even more. Uh, so it's gonna get a lot brighter which is like increasing the gain. So 
Um, a lot of times also what happens in real world photography when you increase the ISO is that it increases grain. It, it amplifies noise in the photograph. And fortunately, Maxwell does not do that. Basically, if you let it continue rendering, the, the graininess goes away. Um, so just get to know this website and get to know how cameras actually work. It's going to help immensely. Um, the, the basic settings that come default in Maxwell are good for normal bright sunny days and then beyond that you're going to want to play around with these different camera options and see if you can come up with an image that that works based on a real world camera under the file tab in the maxwell render options you have uh, typically that's going to be set to automatic where it saves out the mxi file the image the maxwell scene and all the dependencies and one of your options here is actually to choose image only and what that does is that basically will save you a ton of disk space because every time you hit OK here, it sends out an entire folder structure if it's set to automatic with all of these different things included, the MXI file, the image, the Maxwell scene, the, the, sub de the dependency subfolder. And uh, if you set it to image only, it doesn't save any of that stuff except for the image. So if you're just going to be doing uh, render testing, if you're going to be setting up lighting and you want to see the results immediately, without uh, using up a bunch of disk space. This is the best option to choose. And then preferences. This is a, a nice little shortcut to get to the Maxwell manual that comes with the Maxwell render and studio programs to teach you how to use the actual programs um, besides my videos. But then also a manual for the plugin. So if you wanted to know specific things about this interface right here or how it plugs into materials and lights, you would want to look in the plugin manual. So things that are specific to Bonsai, you'll find here. Things that are specific to the different Maxwell applications, you'll find here. Okay. Um, so that's probably a good enough overview for the Maxwell render options. Last thing you got to do is just hit the Maxwell render button right there. You could set up a shortcut for that as well. Um, you know, a lot of people use like Command M, for instance, to to do that, so that it automatically just starts rendering in Maxwell. So here we are. This is the Maxwell interface for Maxwell Render. And you can see here that there's there's a lot going on. Um, I've got my render options, which give me kind of some data about my scene on the left here. So it tells me the size that it's rendering. This is something, again, that's just set up inside of Bonsai. So if I jump back to Bonsai real quick here. If I go to Image Options, this is where I set the size of that rendering. So if you want it to render larger, Go to custom size, maybe by number of pixels. So if you want 2,500, you know, across, you can go ahead and make a, a larger rendering by doing that. All right, back to Maxwell. We also have the uh, color space that it's using, the depth, where it's going to save the file, um, different materials and things. Down below here, we have a preview. So this is a thumbnail of what the image is going to look like in the end. I'll just break this out here real quick. So you can see here that it is rendering and if you use your scroll wheel on your mouse you can zoom the actual preview of the rendering here and, and zoom out to see the whole thing or zoom in to see pieces. So you can see how this starts out very grainy and as it gets through the sampling levels, I'm already on sampling level number two as I'm getting through to number 18 or whatever I have it set at it will become more and more refined. So you'll see here in just a second, there it goes, um, jumps to the next sampling level. Okay, so you can see the next sampling level will be achieved in just over a minute. Um, and then it'll refine one more time at that point. So you can see up here we get a progress bar for our rendering. We can stop that rendering at any time. You know, whenever you feel like this rendering is good enough, the quality level, you can just go ahead and stop it. So what else do we have going on here? We also have, go ahead and just place this back down over here. We have the edit menu. So if you don't see this on your screen or if you don't see the preview, they're all hidden kind of up here under the window pull down menu. Here I can choose edit, preview, and there's other, you know, the console and, and multi-light and all these different windows that we have control over. The edit window is really important because what it allows us to do is make changes either during or after the rendering takes place to our ISO and shutter speed. 
And so again, if I break out the preview window over here, I'll just kind of put it real close here. So I can change the ISO and shutter speed, and you'll notice it'll update the preview right away. So if I turn the ISO up, the camera gets more sensitive, and the exposure gets really hot. And if I pull that ISO down, it gets less sensitive. Okay, so you'll notice that one of the things I cannot change here is I can't change aperture. I can't change f-stop. But I can change ISO and shutter speed interactively. And again, when it gets to the next sampling level, it'll update. So real quick, I'll just pull this down. And get a different type of an image by changing those numbers here and in, in about 30 seconds this will update to reflect what's going on in the preview. So you can also change the intensity of the MXI file, you can change the monitor gamma, you could change the color space all during the rendering process without ever having to stop and, and going back into bonsai and then hitting render again. So all of these things they don't hurt your image at all, they're non-destructive, you can make as many setting changes as you want and it is all changing information that's embedded into the image already and you don't have to worry. So there you can see that that preview just updated with the new settings. So I'll just go back to where I was, 100, oops, not 1,000, but 100 and 1,400 on my shutter speed. And then again, when it gets to the next sampling level, to number six, it will update to reflect my preview. Um, the console window can be a, a very important part because it can help you diagnose problems. Sometimes when you apply certain Maxwell textures that you've downloaded from the internet, the, the bitmaps aren't linked in properly, and it'll let you know down here. It'll give you the errors. It'll tell you what the actual problem is. So um, this can be very helpful when you're troubleshooting, and then you can see exactly where that problem might be. So if it, tell, if it says that it can't find a bitmap file and it's looking for some file in another person's computer, you'll know what the problem is and you can go ahead and fix that. And I'll cover how to do that in the next video on materials. All right. So like I said, you can stop this rendering at any time. And I'm going to let this just go ahead and update to the next sampling level here in a minute. And then I will be able to go ahead and show you what happens when we stop the render. Um, one thing you will notice that the glass is the part of the image that is always the grainiest. And the reason that's the grainiest is because that is what starts to get really refined as we get into the upper sampling levels. So this type of um, material, the glass material, is really where those upper sampling levels help. You could be fine with sampling level five on some of these other things, but unfortunately you will have to wait when you have anything reflective, refractive, transparent, or with subsurface scattering when you get you need to get up to those higher level sampling levels to achieve a good look in the glass so that's really what you've got to wait for now the other cool thing that you can do while even while this one's rendering I'll just go ahead and leave it is I could jump back into bonsai I could pick a whole new view of the project I could go ahead and adjust my levels I could adjust all kinds of things about this so let's say that's the view that I want right there um, I can go ahead and just hit render again and it will now render this view. You can see it creates a whole new Maxwell file and it will open up an entirely new instance of Maxwell and start rendering that scene. And so now they're just go both going at the same time. Now both of these rendering programs are using, you see I have two different ones going here. I have a, a view one and a view two. And if I open up Activity Monitor here, and I'll pull open my um, CPUs, you can see here that it's pegging all four of my processors. So again, more processors is better. So if you've got eight processors, it'll use all eight of them. If you've got 12, it'll use all 12 of them. And how you control that is back in Bonsai, if you go into the Maxwell Render options, what happens is you can control the number of CPU threads that it uses right here. So if you have eight processors and you only want Maxwell to use four, type in four. 
if you wanted to use six go ahead and use six well I have four on my computer and I wanted to use all four if you set this to zero which is the default setting it's gonna use all one, all of your cores so you can limit how much it uses so typically I'm just gonna leave this on zero and let it use all four processors so that it gets done faster but if you have a ton of processors to spare you can go ahead and turn this number down so that you can do other things while Maxwell is still using just the processors that you give it. So if I jump back to Maxwell here, you can see again with this new view, it is refining that slowly over time. And again, it gives me kind of an idea of how much time is left with this rendering to achieve either a thousand minutes or 18 sampling levels. It's going to take 16 hours to get there at this resolution. So processor power does make a huge difference. Get the fastest machine you can when it comes to rendering. It, it'll definitely help out. So you can see this image is getting better and, and better as I, as I let it go. And you can see here that I still have a couple minutes to go to the next sampling level to get to number seven. But I'm OK with this right now. So I'm going to go ahead and just stop this rendering. It's going to go ahead and write that output file. And you can see down here it's writing that. and then the render finish successfully okay any rendering that's already going is going to finish successfully no matter when you stop it it's because you override when it's going to stop okay so now what we can do even the even though the rendering is done is I can still make adjustments to this so I can change the ISO and change the shutter speed if I wanted it to seem like a brighter day maybe I do something like that and you'll notice now it doesn't automatically update so I hit refresh on the preview window it'll think for a second and then it applies those new settings so you can adjust all of the things that are embedded into this file this is not the same thing as going into Photoshop and adjusting the curves or the levels this is actually adjusting the camera that you use to take this photograph okay so make sure that you are aware of that when you're using this so if this uh, particular setting right here isn't quite bright enough for you you know lower the shutter speed get it up to the brightness that you want and hit refresh and tweak it until you get it exactly how you want it here and then go ahead and save your image out so if you're doing PNG files which is how I was doing it I set it up I'm gonna go ahead and just save this to the desktop and just call this render one it gives you the option to go with an 8 or a 16 bit image depth you know I'm fine with 8 for now 16 might be what you want to get the most fidelity out of the image and it goes ahead and saves that file so um, if I jump over to the finder here and go to the desktop what I want to do is look at that render one and just preview it you can see here this is what the rendering looks like so that graininess you see is still all over the place because I didn't let it go very far. But the reflections in the glass, I'm getting the cables that are behind me, I'm getting the sky, the grass. You can tell that this rendering is going to turn out beautiful it's just depending on how long I'm willing to let it go for. All right, so very simple. It's all you have to do to get a scene actually up and working inside of Bonsai. So back to Bonsai here. Now that I've got this file exactly how I want it. I want to make sure that I save it. And now that file has all of the, the settings, the physical sky set up. That's all going to be saved as part of the file. All right. So that is a general introduction into how Maxwell works. Um, there are some other things that come with Maxwell, and I just want to show those to you real quick here. If I jump to my Maxwell application. This is everything that comes when you download Maxwell itself. Okay, so what we've got here is it comes with HDRI files, IES files, and again, these are all have to do with lighting. It comes with different layouts, um, the manual, the materials database. So these are all the materials that ship with Maxwell, and there's quite a few in there. It also comes with all these different programs. Maxwell, which is the one that we're in over here, um, rendering. MXED, which is a Maxwell material editor. Um, you also have a network manager and a network monitor and network render node. These are all for network rendering. 
And then down at the bottom we have Maxwell Studio, which is a completely separate application where you can apply all the textures and everything in the Studio app instead. Um, the goal of my videos is really to just to show you how Maxwell works with Bonsai 3D, so we're not going to get into Studio, but there are lots of resources online and in the manual on how to use Studio. So that download, that 130 megabyte download, comes with quite a few things here that are definitely worth checking out and just seeing what, what came in there. Um, so I recommend you do that. So there's two different parts to that. There's, there's the Maxwell download, which is all the applications and everything to show you this kind of stuff. And then there's also the plugin, which when you install that into Bonsai, gives you the ability to then hook into render, Maxwell render. So that's it for um, just starting off inside of, inside of Bonsai 3D with Maxwell Render. It's a very simple process. Again, just as a kind of a crib sheet, build your model in Bonsai, apply the Bonsai materials or Maxwell materials, and then all you have to do to make sure that it's actually going to render is to create a, a light. So if I delete this light, for instance, and I try to render this inside of Maxwell, it still goes through the process and creates the, the file, but when it actually gets into Maxwell itself, render fails. It says, error, there's no light sources in the scene. Okay, so you, the render will be black, so it's not going to waste your time and not do anything for you. So make sure that you create that actual light here inside the file. All right, so that's it for the general introduction to Maxwell for Bonsai 3D. Uh, we covered how to download and install Maxwell and get it running inside of Bonsai, and then how Bonsai actually uses Maxwell, how Maxwell plugs into it with lighting and with materials. And then we also talked about the Maxwell render interface and the tweaks that you can do during the rendering process to adjust your image. In the next video, we're gonna be talking more about materials we're going to look at applying materials that come from Bonsai. We're going to look at using uh, some of the online material resources for Maxwell and uh, applying those textures to our objects when we need that extra level of realism. All right, so I'll see you in the next video. Bye.